Uh, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for bringing your son, Sasha, uh, who's here to do uh, video tape, uh, the presentation. And welcome back to Georgetown. We first met when uh, he was a visitor to my entrepreneurship class that I teach in the spring of each semester at Georgetown. So I we met a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that connection, and I'd like to welcome you back to Georgetown. Thank you. Thank you. Great, let's go back to the 19th century. You guys don't have laptops, all right? This is the olden time. And born in um, 1813 in St. Louis was a man named Montgomery Blair. His father was Francis Preston Blair. He had a brother named Frank Blair. Jump ahead about 20 years, he goes to West Point and becomes a cadet and ultimately graduates from West Point. His father hitched his wagon to Andrew Jackson, who became President of the United States in the 1830s. And Andrew Jackson invited the father, Francis Preston, to come to Washington, D.C. and publish a newspaper called the Congressional Globe, which ultimately became the Congressional Record. It was the voice of the U.S. government during the Jackson administration for those eight years. Uh, we're so induated at this point in time with so much media, so much access, it's hard for us to remember that back then a newspaper was a treat and what you put in the globe was basically gospel. And so that was how Jackson controlled his entire country through this congressional globe. And Francis Preston Blair was the Carl Rove of the Andrew Jackson administration. In fact, it was called Jackson's Kitchen Cabinet. That made Francis Preston Blair pretty prominent in Washington, D.C. in the 1830s and into the 1840s. Going back to his son, Montgomery Blair, he returned to St. Louis and married and had a wife. Now, at this point in time, I just want to give you a thought as I describe now the trajectory of Montgomery Blair's life as a lawyer. Because I think uh, for three reasons you might find value in it today that you probably weren't thinking about when you sat down. One, it is always good to have some historical grounding when you go forward in life because at some moment in time, I promise you, each of you will be able to talk a little bit more definitively and advance whatever posture you're in if you could talk about Andrew Jackson or talk about the Dred Scott case the way I'm going to explain it to you tonight. So there's historical value in what I'm going to tell you. Secondly, you all hope and I all trust you will become attorneys in due course. Well, the life of Montgomery Blair was the life of an attorney. And what he went through, every single one of you are going to go through. It may not be on the magnitude that ultimately connects with the Civil War in this country the way it did with Montgomery Blair's life, <coughs> but at some level of intensity, each of you as attorneys are going to face the same issues he faced and have to make decisions much the way he had to make decisions. I also am a severe critic of the justice system in America today. And when I talk about Dred Scott, I bet it's not going to be the same way you heard it talked about uh, by the law professors who were giving you, you know, the, legal, the legal view of the whole thing. To that, I say the 21st century is not much different from the 19th century. And as you go into the justice system and you spend you know, a good part of your waking, breathing moments on this earth involved in it, please keep your eyes open because it isn't quite as honorable, perhaps, as you might think. In uh, 1852, tragedy stuck Montgomery Blair's life when his wife and small child were killed. And as a result, although he had become attorney general um, in Missouri, uh, for the state of Missouri at that point in time, his life personally was at an end in that state. And he was invited by his father, who was very well established now in Washington, D.C., to move to Washington, D.C. and start his life all over again. So in the early 1850s, he did. He met and fell in love and married the daughter of a Supreme Court justice. For a wedding present, he was given a small townhouse at, uh, across the street from the White House, which we now call the Blair House today. So that's not too shabby uh, to come to D.C., marry a Supreme Court justice daughter, move into the Blair House, ultimately the Blair House across from the White House. And very shortly, Franklin Pierce, who was president, appointed him as uh, Solicitor General to the newly created Federal Court of Claims. The Federal Court of Claims basically is when you sue the United States government, that's the court that handles the, co of the case. So he was the attorney representing the U.S. government in front of the uh, Court of Claims. He was uh, also free at that time to take private cases. So he had a thriving practice before the United States Supreme Court. 
and he was really at the top of his game in uh, 1854 at age 41. New family, beautiful wife, couple kids, real estate holdings. He bought a lot of land up in what is now Silver Spring, Maryland, and I don't know if you're all from the D.C. area or not, but that's a real Tony suburb north of town now. And life was pretty good. Now at this moment in time, his life and Dred Scott's life intersect because as perhaps you understood on July 4th, not coincidentally, of 1854, Dred Scott publishes a pamphlet explaining his plight, how he needs help to pursue his case to the United States Supreme Court. And this is what he wrote in the concluding, concluding paragraph of that pamphlet. I have no money to pay anybody at Washington to speak for me. My fellow men, can any of you help me in my day of trial? Will nobody speak for me at Washington, even without hope of other reward than the blessings of a poor black man and his family? I do not know. I can only pray that some good heart will be moved by pity to do that for me, which I cannot do for myself, and that if the right is on my side, it may be so declared by the high court to which I have appealed. That pamphlet was circulated by the anti-slavery movement people in Washington, D.C., to all the attorneys here. In fact, the pamphlet was circulated up and down the eastern seaboard in July of 1854. August of 1854, nobody wants this case. September, October, November, December, nobody will take this case because it is a political atomic bomb. It's hard for us to realize now we think red and blue states, how divided the country is. The country was really divided, as we ultimately know a couple of years later, between the pro-slavery, anti-slavery forces, the northern forces, the southern forces, however you want to characterize it. Nobody wanted that case. And on December 30th, 1854, the end of that year, the case was officially docketed at the Supreme Court, which of course that building wasn't there then, it was in the, in the um, Capitol building, and no one had come forward. Uh, at that point in time, Dred Scott was from Missouri, Montgomery Blair was from Missouri, he received several letters from people in Missouri saying, you must help this man. And so, uh, shortly after the new year in 1855, Montgomery Blair agreed to take up the case. This was a decision that was not easy because he knew, one, he wasn't going to get paid. Two, no matter what happened, half the country was going to hate him. And three, why ruin this wonderful kind of country club life he had going here? But he later wrote, um, just before, uh, just after his oral argument, two years later, quote, I believe in the southern states almost every lawyer feels bound to give his services when asked in such a case arising in the community to which he belongs. And I'm just going to read that to you again, because I promise you, you are going to get a plea, much like Dred Scott's plea that I read to you during your career. Not once. Uh, we get them constantly. And the minute you put yourself out to help one person, you are going to be like a light to moths, because there are so few people who really will help and can help the people who need help. And you're going to have to ask yourself if you feel bound to give your services in the community you're in. Montgomery Blair happened to be in the community of Washington, D.C. in the 1850s. You're all going to end up in some community, whether it's small claims court, traffic court, or whether it is the United States Supreme Court. I just urge you that at some moment in your life, consider whether you do have a duty and whether you should follow it. Uh, I don't know in 1855, uh, January, whether he knew how he was going to suffer for representing Dred Scott, but I, I want to take you through that family history now. It took two years for the case to reach oral argument, which was held on December 15, 1856. And you probably know more than I do about this, but he stood there for three hours. And just imagine yourself having to stand up and argue for three hours with only your notes in front of you, arguing significantly that the court had jurisdiction to hear this case, arising as it did from a territory instead of a state, uh, right, uh, arguing that men of African descent had been previously recognized by the Supreme Court, and as such, there should be no barrier to representing, uh, recognizing Dred Scott's claim simply because he was of African descent. And this is an interesting part of the case for me, anyway. He argued that a state court decision had no more validity, I'm sorry, deserved no more respect than the wisdom and validity of the decision itself. That is really its articulation to this principle of stare decisis, which I guess they have some sense of, that you know, there's some logical progression to why you arrive at, at what you've done based upon prior cases. 
To me, uh, that is really, really interesting, because here we have this first question, is the federal government really on top of the states, or is it not? Is it some sort of peri delecto? And then the most interesting part, I guess, ultimately, which it came down to, was that Congress had the power to prohibit slavery in the territories. This was a very hotly contested issue, because the southern states one of those territories open for potential slavery, or at least be able to influence the decision on the territorial level, rather than Washington, D.C., from which they felt very alienated. Now, I don't know if they touched on this or not. I'd actually be curious if, if someone would let me know. At that time, there were nine justices of the Supreme Court. Five of them were from southern slaveholding states. Four of them were from northern non-slaveholding states. Did, they, did you guys catch that in your uh, arguments or not? Probably not. Okay. The southern state justices had in mind to get a decision out of the Supreme Court which would establish the principle that the Congress did not have power to outlaw slavery in the territories. That would then move the question from the federal question down to the territorial questions, and that would advance their interest. The northern, four northern justices, of course, were leaning the other way, thinking that we need to get involved here and establish you know, the rights of Dred Scott to, to be free because he'd left, uh, I guess, Missouri at that point in time. The five Southern justices had a problem, however, because they were not happy issuing a decision of that scope, limiting the federal power to outlaw slavery, on a five to four decision. Now, this is when President-elect Buchanan gets involved. Technically, more or less in November of 1855, excuse me, uh, November of 1856, he gets elected President of the United States to be sworn in in January of 1857. Buchanan was not anti-slavery, although he wasn't particularly pro-slavery, but it was in his interest to know what was going to happen with this Dred Scott case which had galvanized the country. President-elect Buchanan then wrote one of the Southern Justices of the Supreme Court and said, what's going on? Where is this case going? and got the report back that the five Southern justices needed one more justice to come over to their side so they could move the case from deciding it on whether or not the Supreme Court had jurisdiction to a ruling which said in effect that the federal government could not out outlaw slavery in the territories. Now our idea of our nine fine justices sitting up there as they put on their black robes and in the quiet of their chambers decide the rule of law based upon stare decisis and logic. But of course, at this point, President-elect Buchanan writes Justice Greer of Pennsylvania and says, I've got a deal for you. You align with the five southern state justices to give us a 6-3 vote going this way, and life will be good for you later on. Justice Greer agrees in writing to do so. So now, the law isn't the law anymore, is it? It's just dirty backroom politics like we practice up on the hill and every place else, it seems, at this point. And of course, on March 6, 1857, Justice Taney delivers the opinion of the court. I know you all had the fun of wading through a 19th century Supreme Court opinion. And if you could make any sense of it, I'd be glad to be told about it, because I never could. I've tried several times. I'm not going to go on those legal issues today, but I want to take up Montgomery Blair's life at this point in time. The decision comes down. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the man who had been the owner of Dred Scott as a slave had died during this period of time. Montgomery Blair travels back to Missouri to probate the estate of the dead man, and I'm a little fancy here, but basically what happens is Dred Scott then is transferred under the probate estate to a sister of the dead man, the slave owner, and ultimately she had agreed anyways to free him anyway. He never was going to become a slave again. But he goes back to Missouri to make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed. President Buchanan gets sworn in, and one of his first acts of office is to fire Montgomery Blair as Solicitor General for the Court of Claims. This did not make Montgomery Blair's wife very happy because the income for the family was steadily uh, and largely relied upon that steady federal paycheck from the federal court of claims. You all end up in different kind of scenarios. I'm a sole practitioner and I don't have a paycheck coming in every week. I get sometimes a retainer and sometimes you got busy times and quiet times. And a private practitioner the way Montgomery Blair was, that was sort of his deal. But to have the federal job was great. And there is a, a family letter from, from Montgomery Blair's wife uh, complaining to her mother that why did, this, why did my husband represent Dred Scott? He knew he'd get in trouble. He just lost his job, and now we don't have enough money. I can't afford carriages. And her complaints kind of fall on deaf ears. If you, if you, you know, her lifestyle didn't change that bad. 
But I do want you to remember that Montgomery Blair had to go to bed every night and listen to this part. So <laughs> when you think your personal life is not going to become part of your professional life, uh, understand that it will, because there will be demands upon you uh, in your professional life that will spill over into your personal life. And if you don't have a very understanding significant other, or at least one you've acclimated to this kind of thing, uh, you might be in for an unhappy surprise. Montgomery Blair did okay in 1858 and 1859. He was right <coughs> across the street from the White House. Life was not in ter terrible for him, but the country was really schisming at this point in time, and you just couldn't be on one side or the other or on the fence anymore, I should say. You had to be on one side or the other. So in 1860, he took an active part in the presidential campaign of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I'm not a huge Lincoln scholar, a huge Lincoln-Douglas debate scholar, but the Dred Scott decision was really crucial for Lincoln in distancing and distinguishing himself from Douglas during those debates. And as a result, Lincoln got the nomination. We know he got uh, elected President of the United States in 1860. One of his first acts was to appoint Montgomery Blair as his postmaster general. We all sort of titter about the post office now and going postal and all the rest of it. But back in 1850, 1860, the post office was the largest patronage organization of the federal government. You hired the postmaster general in every single town and all the postal employees. So it was a significant and very important job. He held that job for three and a half years under Abraham Lincoln during the, uh, obviously, the Civil War, or the war between the states, depending on your perspective, I guess. And during that time, he did some very interesting things that we sort of take for granted uh, at this part in time. He uh, improved the post offices by establishing free city delivery. That is, uh, the mailman came to your house and gave you your mail. Prior to his administration of <coughs> the postal office, that wasn't the case. You had to go get your mail at the post office. He established uh, a money order system where you could give a post office in Philadelphia $20, and then it, it would, you could then mail the receipt to somebody in Washington, D.C., who then could take the $20 receipt and go to the post office and get the $20. Obviously, we're ATM or instant banking, we don't even think about it anymore, but moving money back then safely and securely was very important. So he put the imprint tour of the U.S. government on that, which helped commerce in a lot of ways that we really can't even think and trace about anymore. And he was the first one to insist that they start using railways to move mail from city to city. Before then, it was put on horse-drawn carriages which was part of a cartel of carriage cartage people up and down the eastern seaboard moving mail around. And he had to fight through that, but he finally got things moving on, on the mail. In 1861, he traveled to Switzerland because he had been working on the International Postal Union. And this may sound trivial today, but it wasn't then. If I wanted to mail a letter to somebody in Paris, I had to buy French stamps in the United States to put them on my letter. Because otherwise, when it got to Paris, the French government wouldn't do anything with the letter unless it had French stamps. The International Postal Union in Switzerland uh, established a protocol, largely under his leadership, to allow U.S. stamps, when they arrive in Paris, to be continued and delivered without further postage on it, because we would take French stamps and do the same thing. That opened up the whole world to a whole bunch of communication that really wasn't possible or easy at that point in time. Uh, you could almost call it an early day internet. Um, <clears throat> the Civil War comes. The uh, Confederate troops mass at Frederick, Maryland, if you're off and around here, it's about 40 or 50 miles due north of Washington. The fellow troops, the uh, Confederate troops had come around Washington in the north and were heading south. They made a distinct reason, apparently, to go to Silver Spring, Maryland, where Montgomery Blair's mansion was, and they burned his mansion to the ground because he had been the attorney for Dred Scott, and they wanted to make an example of him and their displeasure with that. They didn't burn any other mansions between Frederick and Washington, D.C. And this is purely an apocryphal story told to me by my grandfather. I, I can't, everything else I gave, I've said today, I can give you a cite for, point you to the letter. But this is apocryphal, and I'll give it to you. Apparently, when they got time to burn down his mansion, he had gone to school at West Point with many of the officers who were serving in the Confederate Army. As you know, they all split. And apparently, he said, well, if you've got to burn down my house, I understand that's the, the horrors of war, but there are several dozen cases of fine French wine in there. It seems kind of a pity to let those go to waste. And the Confederate troops spent the next two and a half days consuming the wine, slowing their progress on Washington, D.C., allowing the Union forces to mass along the border of Washington, D.C., at the various forts up there to prevent the taking of the Washington, D.C. by Confederate Army. It's probably possible, but it's a good story. <laughs> Uh, 1864, Lincoln is up for re-election. 
his renomination as the candidate for the Republican Party is no certainty. There is a group called the Radical Republicans, and they have promoted a candidate named John C. Fremont to be a contestant for the Republican nomination instead of Lincoln to be president of the United States. Uh, it's hard for us to imagine now as we you know, lionize the guy, but there were a lot of people who did not like him. In the wrangling surrounding the uh, nomination of Fremont, the nomination of uh, Lincoln at the Republican Party, Montgomery Blair became the target of the Fremont fraction. Faction. They did not like him. He was uh, not to their liking because he had represented Dred Scott. He was from Missouri, technically a southerner. And they said he had to go. And ultimately, the deal was cut uh, in September of 1864. And Montgomery Blair, uh, well, Fremont withdrew his nomination as a candidate for the Republican Party. And Montgomery Blair was fired by Lincoln as uh, postmaster general. I have brought a copy today of a letter from Abraham Lincoln to Montgomery Blair. And it says, my dear sir, you have generously said to me more than once that whenever your resignation could be a relief to me, uh, at, it would be at my disposal, the time has come. And I'll just pass the letter around so I can find a little something or other. But there's the letter which fired Montgomery Blair because he had represented Dred Scott and offended too many people in the North. I hope you pick up on this theme that if you do take on unpopular causes, you can expect uh, payback in due course of time. <laughs> Three days later after that letter is written, on September 22, 1864, Montgomery Blair travels to New York City. Uh, Cooper Union, if you're uh, from New York City, would know what that is. That was one of the early <coughs> colleges in New York City. He addresses some 20,000 people at Cooper's Union urging support for Lincoln, who had fired him four days before, uh, to, be, to get the, the nomination for the Republican Party candidate for president. Uh, that's pretty good team playing. And, you know, I'm not lionizing the guy. He knew what the quid pro quo was because Chief Justice Taney, who you all know, was sick, was dying, and everyone knew he was going to die very soon. And, in fact, on October 12, 1864, Chief Justice Taney dies. That means there is an opening at the Supreme Court of the United States. There is an opening for Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And um, everyone thought, and Lincoln got besieged with letters saying, you need to appoint Montgomery Blair. He's earned it, he's qualified, he knows what he's doing, he would be Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I challenge any of you to tell me that at some moment, if not yet, soon to be, you won't lie in bed and say, gee, what if George Bush called me and asked me to be the next Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court? I mean, honestly, it is the dream job for every attorney's career. And uh, I think Montgomery Blair probably coveted that more than anything and helped rally forces in his support. However, the same radical Republicans who did not like him as Postmaster General for the patronage he wielded did not like the idea of him becoming Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. They were concerned, according to them, that his Southern sympathies, even though he had represented Dred Scott, would offend the newly uh, reintegrated Southern states. And as a result, they wanted a more moderate candidate as Justice of the Supreme Court. And they, Lincoln ultimately appointed Salmon uh, Portland Chase as the Chief Justice and he had a distinguished career as well. The next and final 20 years of Montgomery Blair's life were spent uh, still engaged in politics. He uh, went out to Louisiana in 1874 to uh, do a recount of the votes for presidential election out there. Had a quite nice career, I guess, and finally died at the age of 70 um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. That was his life, and that was how the Dred Scott case kind of uh, intersected it. And I just sort of want to go back to those three first themes again. I can't emphasize how important it is that you understand the historical basis of what happens, not just what you read in the reported decisions. Because the reported decisions tend to give you this perfect view of the world and the perfect view of the rule of law. And it's a lot, oftentimes it's really dirty politics going on back there. So unless you kind of dig in a little bit more behind the cases, I think you're missing the import of them. Professionally, as I mentioned before, you are going to be challenged. <coughs> People are going to come to you, and they're going to say, I need your help. And you're going to have to probably have addressed this issue beforehand to know how you're going to deal with it and uh, understand what, that, what that, that is going to mean to you. And then personally, I, you know, I am his great-great-grandson. I, I carry his name, and I, I probably am projecting more than I should about this. But I think he died a happy man. I think he was pleased, notwithstanding his house has got bombed, uh, burned down, his wife was bitching at him. Uh, he you know, got fired from his government jobs and all the rest of it. I think he died you know, happy because he was honorable and uh, he did what he was supposed to do as an attorney, which is represent those who can't represent themselves, like Dred Scott. 
that's sort of the, the long and short of the Dred Scott case that I had for you, you know, prepared to chat about. Uh, we can move into the 21st century and talk about the DC Mavin if you want. I can answer questions about, that I know, if I can, about uh, Dred Scott. Uh, any particular direction anybody wants to go? I'm going to grab a sip of Coke. If there's